Uh, you served as the Commissioner for Trade at the European Commission 20 years ago when China joined the World Trade Organization. So do you still remember when and uh, where uh, you got the news on China's entry into WTO? Of course I do. A major event uh, for world trade, for China, for the rest of the world. I think the moment I knew China would join the World Trade Organization is when I got uh, the agreement of uh, Premier Suwongji. The US had already clinched a deal with China on China's terms of entry with the US. We all knew that once US and EU had gotten a deal, then the rest of members of WTO would follow. It took China almost 15 years uh, to go through the negotiations process. But at that time, what are the most concerns? The most difficult issues, first on how much would China open its market? And there were good reasons to do that. But there were also resistances within the Chinese system uh, because more foreign competition would have an impact on Chinese producers. As always, when you open trade, it's good because you import efficiencies, you import better ways of producing things. But on the other side, the one at home that produced these things may not be happy. And second, how much of the rules which were the rules of the World Trade Organization, would be applied to China, like, for instance, protection of international property. Intellectual property was not properly protected in China before China joined. And in both cases, because of the importance of these changes, there were transition periods. It did not happen overnight. It took sometimes five years, sometimes 10 years for China to fully join the terms of accession. 20 years after China joined the WTO, in retrospect, how would you say, what does it mean for the world economy? What does it mean for the global trading system? Overall, uh, it was a win-win game. China gained, look at its economic performance, which has been stellar for the last 20 years and one of the reasons why it has been so great is because it has modernized its economy under the pressure of foreign competition and it has been good for the rest of the world because overall producers from outside China gained a lot of business, a lot of volumes, a lot of access to the Chinese market and that's what the numbers say. 15 years ago imports in China were much lower than exports. The surplus was 10% of GNP. Today, it is 1% of GNP, which means that imports have increased more than exports, contrary to what many people believe. So China benefited from lower prices and better quality of goods and services, and the rest of the world increased its uh, growth while, while exporting much more to China. Looking forward, what area you would uh, expect to see China playing a larger role? I think the area where China will have to increase its participation in world trade is services. If you look at goods on the one side, China is open, okay. But we, when you look at services, uh, financial services, household services, uh, there still is a lack of competition on the Chinese market, which further market opening uh, would help. You were the longest serving WTO DG two terms. So uh, tell us viewer first, why the World Trade Organization need the reform and how urgent it is? Well, I think it's urgent because the world has changed and the rule book of WTO has not changed enough during uh, the last 20 years. You now have a lot of digital trade, issues like the contribution of trade to environmental sustainability were not important 20 years ago, have become important. You've got a lot of differences in the way data, for instance, are stored, accessible, protected. So the world has changed. So we need the WTO rulebook to adjust. And this has proven difficult because of lack of agreement 
between major members, notably US, China and EU, who are now the three elephants in world trade. But there is also another issue, which is that the WTO as an operation, the WTO itself does not work properly. And we need also to reform the way the organization works and notably the relationship between the members of WTO and the Director General and the Secretariat, which in my view is unfavorably imbalanced on the side of too much uh, authority for member states and not enough for the DG and the Secretary. Although the you know, global trading system has experienced a lot of turbulence in the past several years, but uh, globalization is still a shared value among um, the majority of the world population. Yet, why there is a lack of uh, political impetus to reform the WTO? You can have an economic globalization, but you need a certain degree of political globalization, of understanding of how this world works. And then we have this big difference between US and China, which for the moment is there is a level of agreement which is much narrower than what we would need. So we have to keep geoeconomics moving in the side of integration, and which is good for peace, which is good for human and economic exchanges. What we need is enough agreement between the big players on rules that allow economic exchange to take place in a fair way. And this is what the WTO is about. Globalization and uh, regional economic integration have emerged as two major waves of the world economic development. So how can we understand the relations between the two? Uh, does regionalization challenge globalization or build upon it? My answer is the second. I think regionalization and globalization go hand in hand. It's not either globalization or regionalization. If you look at the history of trade and economics on this planet for the last 50 years, there has always been a synergetic relationship between regional trade integration and global trade integration. Now, this being said, you're right, we've had problems with trade openness in recent times, which stem from three major sources. One, uh, this uh, stupid uh, trade policy uh, by Mr. Trump when he was president of the US, terribly protectionist and inefficient way of dealing with trade issues. Second, we've had this big COVID pandemic, uh, which has revealed that some supply chains may be not resilient enough to ensure the security of some imports. And then we have this sort of post or semi-post COVID imbalance between supply and demand, which has created logistical problems in uh, some transport systems or in semiconductor production. So we should not confuse these three things. They may be conjunctural, they may ease in the future, provided the US go back to the negotiating table in the European, in the WTO, and provided they accept that they, Europe and China, have to find a compromise on how to improve the rules of world trade. For the moment, we are not there. My view, for what it's worth, is that the US are not seriously back to the negotiating table in the World Trade Organization. Some people have argued that um, the pandemic would help accelerate job reshoring and rebuilding world supply chains. But I remember you once said in an uh, interview in 2020, globalization is efficient and painful. Deglobalization is inefficient and painful. So almost two years uh, since COVID first hit the world, do you still believe in what you have said? The COVID pandemic at some stage, because of the impact it had on the economies, led to a moment of deglobalization because of the shock of this virus and the necessity to protect populations, which has led to a moment of more economic nationalism. But I think this is relatively short-lived and that 
the next stage of globalization will be different from the previous one. But overall, I think economic interdependence, which trade reveals, will keep growing on this planet, not least uh, because the digitalization of economies and because data flow are now an enormous part, although unaccounted, of world trade. How do you think China's endeavor in promoting the global opening up and uh, cooperation in the past uh, 20 years? And uh, what do you expect more uh, to come in the future? I think 20 years ago, we had a sort of balance between geoeconomics and geopolitics. We now are in a different period where, unfortunately, in my view, geopolitics have a larger weight than geoeconomics, and that stems um, from uh, the very rapid growth of China and the view in the US that this is a threat. And I hope in the future, at some time, that this will rebalance more the way we had 20 years ago than what we have now, because I believe if this world is driven by geopolitics rather than by geoeconomics, it is a more dangerous world and this is not what I like.